Often when a creature of undeath rears its ugly head, noble adventurers prepare to fight or get ready to run for their lives, and today's creature is no different. However, it does subvert everything you might think you know about the undead and their role in the cosmos. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Monster of the Week, the show where we dig up old creatures from past versions of Dungeons and Dragons and bring them to light for use in your current 5th edition game. My name is Dungeon Dead, also known as Josiah, and today we're going to be talking about a creature from Dragon Magazine number 334, going way back. I am proud to present to you the Humbaba, which might be the first non-evil or actually good aligned undead to grace the pages of 5th edition. Now it might not sound very good or even neutral aligned when I describe what it looks like because it is a 20 foot tall giant literally comprised of dead bodies. Definitely a hideous thing to behold, however it is made up of the bodies that belong to valiant dead, not just random soldiers or whatever necromancers usually draw their dead body supply from, but heroes who died defending one god or another. These creatures truly are not your typical undead encounter. They're not controlled by anyone or anything, really. They are guardians of ancient tombs belonging to noble heroes, burial grounds that are protected by a certain god, or even the areas where the veil between life and death becomes very thin and sometimes non-existent, such as the River Styx. Another big difference with these creatures is they don't necessarily resort to combat or mindless brutality right away like many other undead do. They'll try to talk it out. They will give you fair warning as they speak from the many rotten throats that are on their body, and they'll try to explain to you that you're not supposed to be wherever you happen to be, and they'll convince you to leave, or they won't, and combat will ensue. So today we're going to talk about just what these creatures can actually do in combat, a few changes I've made to make them a bit more modern for our 5th edition standards, and of course some plot hooks and different ways you might want to actually make use of these creatures in your D&D game. So without further ado, let's get right into it with some... So the main bread and butter of this creature and what it actually wants to do is slam its opponent. As a giant creature, it of course has a very powerful slam attack, but that slam is a giant fist coming down and that fist is literally made of dead bodies. And the thing that's kind of creepy about this creature is that all the bodies that make it up just kind of dumbly move and wave their arms around or make noises, which is extremely unsettling. But it means when it slams a creature, all the arms and limbs that make up its giant fist are going to grab and automatically grapple whatever creature it was attacking if the attack hits. Now being grappled is of course never a good thing, but it's especially bad in this situation because if you are still grappled at the start of the Humbaba's next turn, it can use an ability that drains constitution as it literally saps the life force from creatures that are within its grasp. And if that creature is killed because of this constitution drain, it is not able to be revived, it doesn't make death saves, it just instantly dies and it's then pulled in and becomes part of this giant creature which of course gives the Humbaba a few extra hit points. Constitution damage or any type of ability damage is exceedingly rare in 5th edition, so it's always kind of interesting when it comes up. And I've included in the stat blocks the specific rules of what happens when you lose constitution, because, as you're well aware, when you level up, you gain hit points based on your constitution modifier. If your constitution goes down, your modifier decreases, that means you retroactively lose those hit points. So if you have a plus 5 constitution and you're level 10, that means you have an extra 50 hit points because your constitution is so high. So if you lose 2 points of your constitution and it goes down to a plus 4 modifier at level 10, that means you lose 10 hit points because you lose that extra 1 hit point you would have gained from each level. So not only is it causing its regular slam damage, but it's also causing extra damage on top of that with the threat of total destruction if it's able to continue grabbing onto a single creature. That is the primary means of attack that this creature wants to do. Every turn it wants to be slamming things, grabbing people, and sapping their life force. 
Now, if it can't do that or it's unable to get close enough to actually hit a creature, it does have the option to just throw things so it has a rock attack like many of the other giants in the monster manual. It's able to just biff slabs of whatever type of hard material are around. And it does have access to a few spells that it can use as well that just are mostly for flavor purposes, but in some situations might come in handy, like protection from good and evil or ray of enervation. Another really powerful spell on its list as well is Circle of Death, which is extremely useful against groups of creatures. So depending on who or what it's fighting, it has a few different options with how it wants to take care of its foes, all of which are very thematic. Now, of course, like many undead, this creature has lots of resistances and immunities, so it's going to be fairly hard to bring down. One thing that's kind of neat about it, though, is if it is about to be destroyed, it has, I mean, this would be up to you as a DM, but say less than 10% of its hit points, it can actually discorporate as an action, basically meaning that it just falls to the ground and all the bodies that make up the greater form of this creature just kind of scatter everywhere and it looks like it's dead, because that is what would happen if this creature were destroyed. However, some of your more perceptive characters might notice this creature isn't actually dead. If it's able to pass itself off as being destroyed, it will just bide its time and wait for the characters to move on, with the intent of course of gathering its strength and coming after them if they continue to trespass wherever it is they're trespassing, but it's just kind of a neat little flavor thing that makes this character feel a lot more alive, for lack of a better word. So that's what this creature can do once we've rolled initiative, but of course if the players can avoid that or leading up to that we want to look at some ways we can actually use this creature in the world, so let's talk about some... Now as I mentioned, these creatures are typically used as guardians for sacred places. So if you're running a campaign where the players are going to be kind of exploring an area that is the threshold of the land of the living and the land of the dead, like the river Styx, these guys would be perfect as an obstacle, maybe something to either overcome as an enemy or to possibly assist them as an ally if they're doing some kind of mission on behalf of a deity like Charon. At the end of the day, the biggest thing is these creatures are here to protect that balance and guard that threshold. So if your players aren't able to convince this creature that their intentions are pure and they intend to uphold that balance, then they're not going to be passing through without a fight. And for those of you who are familiar with the Grave Cleric subclass, this is probably sounding a little bit familiar. And that's actually an interesting thing about these creatures, is they will never attack clerics of the Grave Domain. So if you happen to have a cleric of the Grave Domain in your party, that would be a really interesting role-playing opportunity to kind of let that character shine. Because of course the Humbaba is going to rise and comprise itself and attack the party potentially or at least speak to them and see who these people are that are trespassing in this sacred area and once it realizes that there is a grave cleric with them it will allow them to pass because it understands that grave cleric is of course seeking to uphold the same balance that it is. Now of course if you like this creature as a giant undead amalgamation formed into a humanoid shape but you don't really like the flavor of it you could easily kind of do away with all of that stuff and just use it as the minion of some kind of necromancer or other character delving into undead and necromantic magics. While it's not really what this creature is intended to be, they would be a really interesting siege engine in a giant undead assault. It also creates a bit of a different and a much higher level spin on the trope of the necromancer raising up all these dead bodies from a graveyard, but instead of having them just be mere zombies, a bunch of them kind of amalgamate together to create this essentially what could be a boss for a mid to low level party. I think my favorite way to use these creatures though is as they're intended, as a guardian, but not of something so esoteric as the threshold between two worlds, but specifically guarding a singular temple. Maybe there's an ancient temple that the players are going to for some kind of quest reason, or they're possibly just going to delve it and pillage it like any other dungeon. And then a Humbaba amalgamates and simply rests in front of the door to this ancient temple. The temple's long since been abandoned, nothing inside of it aside from maybe some old apparitions or some monsters that managed to get in through other means, but the front gates are guarded by a Humbaba, which creates a problem. But it's not a problem with only one solution. See, the players might be able to talk their way in there if they can think of a good enough story reason to actually get this creature to shirk its responsibilities, or at least convince it that they're not there to do anything this creature wouldn't be okay with. 
It's also possible that they might need to find another entrance, which could lead to some more exploration around this ancient temple and trying to figure out how to get inside without passing through the main gate. And of course, if all else fails and your party is much more combat focused, maybe they decide they're going to take this thing head on. I feel like this is effective as a challenge though when it's for a party that's maybe a little bit too low level to actually be fighting this thing. Because a Humbaba doesn't specifically want to kill the party, so if it defeats them or if they retreat, it's not going to chase after them. It's going to just go back to its post, sit back down, maybe even discoporate into a pile of bodies. So it's not a fight the players have to have. It's not like you're forcing them to fight this thing to the death. It's there and they just need to find a way around it, which I think is cool from a story perspective, but it also creates an interesting challenge that isn't something we always have in D&D. And again, knowing players, I'm positive that they'll surprise you in whatever way they come up with to try to defeat a challenge like that. Maybe that random item they picked up six months ago will actually come in handy for once. In any case, that is the Humbaba. I think it's a really fascinating creature. I'm really happy to be sharing this with you, and I'm looking forward to using this in one of my own games coming up in the future. Also, just want to give a big shout out to my friend Artie on Twitter for sending this my way and telling me which specific issue of Dragon Magazine to find this in. And of course, if you do want to use this in your game, in the description below, you can find a link to the stat block. It's all just there in a Google document as well as a link to my Patreon, where if you are one of my lovely patrons, you can get the full Monster Manual style stat block there. In any case, I just want to thank you guys so much for watching. I really do appreciate it, and I will see you guys in the next one. Until then.